it would be nice uh, to make it hand drawn by pencil on paper. It's a very old school handmade technique, uh, which we thought that it's it's good fit for the robotic world, which is usually in science fiction it's usually very cold and metallic and and uh, very exact. So we wanted to break it somehow and make it more warm and this is this is our uh, lead artist Adolf Lachmann he's a great painter and it's him in his studio <laughs> this is table he's also sculpt sculpture and here you can see actual machinarium uh, backgrounds on paper. There's a funny story uh, that he's, he's a very good painter and he's so exact that the pictures he made uh, were too exact and too, mm, too perfect. So we were discussing how to achieve a more relaxed feeling, more, lo more lousiness and clunkiness. And he, so he started to draw with his left hand, even though he's uh, right-handed. And it was perfect, it worked. <laughs> so the whole machinarium is, uh, is drawn by his left hand. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, in the end, he was so skilled, even with his left hand, that uh, it, uh, it started to and. Then we scan it and put the drawing into the computer where it's um, colored and textured. And this is the final piece. Where here again. And again. It's a lot of discussion every time for every uh, background and picture we go back and forth and discuss every little detail. It's a very laborious process. Here, is, here you can see the one background on back with, uh, this is the first attempt, this backdrop, which I, don't li I didn't like. So <laughs> we agree that it uh, needs to be changed. And this is the second version, much better. And the final location. We use a lot of textures uh, of real, real from real f photos of some rotten pieces of wood and molded walls and s such stuff. And it's our hobby with Adolf. We both love to take pictures of these uh, textures and old walls. Sometimes we make our own uh, <laughs> devices for taking pictures. We also make uh, the sound of ourselves. We don't use any, any sound banks and libraries. And it's also a very important part uh, of our game, sound and music. So we put a lot of effort into it uh, for the new game. We bought very expensive equipment that only to make the sound sound a bit better. And here is uh, here is our sound maker uh, Tomáš Dvořák, and this is our music maker. His name is also Tomáš Dvořák, even though he's a different guy. <laughs> um, Tomáš Dvořák, Floex, the musician. He always uh, starts with uh, piano or guitar for composing the music. He also uses notes because he's uh, <laughs> versed in it. And then uh, he put the music together in computer, but he's uh, recording a lot of live instruments, to, uh, which, is, which is very important to achieve the mm, handmade and more live uh, feeling, which we like. He also uses a lot of uh, exotic instruments like Japanese flute or kalimba, African instrument, and a lot of uh, analog machine sound effects. 
even program his own uh, sound effects. Okay, that, that was that was for uh, making a machinarium. Uh, and now I have a few uh, very cultic uh, notes about game design. Uh, it's not any comprehensive game design lecture, not at all. Just a few notes from the top of my head, um, which I think are important. The first is challenge. Uh, I often ask myself if uh, challenge is really important in games. Uh, it definitely is important, but I believe it's not vital. And there are games which are proof of that. Uh, for example, the game Proteus or Dear Esther. If you know these games, you are only walking on some islands and that's it. You don't have any, any uh, quests. There are no puzzles, you can't be killed or anything. And still, it somehow manages to be fun. So I was uh, exploring these games. Why are they fun? And uh, I saw, that I, I, I um, realized that there are some subtle things which make uh, the game fun. Like in Proteus, you can, you can, uh, chase uh, bees which are there somewhere on a, on a on a meadow and it doesn't have any meaning uh, you can't uh, catch them or anything it's just a lot of fun to to chase them and to listen to their funny buzzing so it's definitely game even there is no challenge and we are trying to explore this even more and, and put some of these elements into our own games of course there are uh, interactive toys, which is also a very imp interesting uh, genre for us. Uh, those are some interactive elements which you can play with in the game, but you can't beat it. It's just it's just for fun. You can just play with it, and that's all. Um, there's there's no goal or anything. So we are as well uh, as well. We are trying to put uh, as much. Uh, interact toys as possible into our games and with this we want to achieve more replayability adventure games are said to be uh, said to have a no replayability value which I don't think it's true because if uh, if you for example if you like uh, some musical record you know it after the first listening you know it all so it should have no replayability value, but it has, of course. You can play it over and over and, and find some little details. We, we, we are also trying to put a lot of interactive details which you can find uh, if you play it for the second or third time. And there, are, in our new game, there will be many really hard to get achievements, um, which you some probably don't even notice for the first time and if you like, love the game you can play it again and try to collect all the achievements or just try to mm, soak into the atmosphere again which is also very important for us uh, we, we don't want to create games which you feel urged to beat as quickly as possible and finish it that's not the goal. The goal is just to be there in the game and enjoy it, uh, just to soak into the atmosphere and uh, enjoy being there. And later you can uh, go back to some places at the game which you liked and enjoy them ag again. Um, another note is about rules. You can, you can read a lot of rules for every game genre and it's it's definitely important and rewarding to read those uh, advices and rules, but you should always remember that it's important to break at least some of those rules. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to achieve uh, anything really original and innovative. Uh, it's also nice um, and good if uh, the game is unpredictable. For example, we create one puzzle in Machinarium where 
you are asked some by by fan robot you are asked some quiz questions and you have to answer wrongly it those those questions are fairly easy but you need to answer wrong answers to make him angry and to be able to proceed and this is this is something which I think make the game more surprising and maybe fun, I believe. And fun is uh, the other word. Uh, I think it's the most important and only r rule uh, in games, even in really serious and deep games about some ugly topics. It, it also needs to be fun in some way. And there's uh, so many ways uh, how we can achieve this, but you definitely uh, should try to make fun games. <laughs> um, also, you shouldn't make any compromises, I believe. If you think that, if you have some vision, you should make it uh, the best you can. Uh, with no compromises, with visual style, or game design difficulty, anything. Uh, it it has to be like you really want it. Uh, you shouldn't never uh, look at some target audience or anything. Uh, also, you should uh, don't take care about ratings, I believe, because the, the rating system is quite stupid, especially PEGI and uh, ESRB. <laughs> um, we have little time, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, you, should ha you should have a very clear, coherent vision about your game, and then follow it. Uh, it's easy. And for it, it's important to have one author for each project. We have. We have this. Uh, I was I was the leader and author for Machinarium. Yara Pachi, my colleague, was the author for Botanicula, and this this author of the game has the power of veto on every aspect of the game, and it helps to achieve the the vision. Even the team is also very important, and you should listen to your team, and everybody should have a possibility to to talk on every topic. Here are a few games which I think uh, are great uh, because they have clear vision and original style and everything. Uh, this is Proteus, Limbo, Journey, of course, Sword and Sorcery, B, uh, Thomas was alone, or uh, iPad game, uh, Device 6, or every game from Simogo is pretty great. Well. Uh, let's uh, look at business and marketing just very briefly because we're out of time. Uh, you should start early with marketing. That's definitely important. You should build community. You should have creative approach. This is very easy to, uh, to say but difficult to do. Uh, one example, for the first time when we decided to make a really huge sale on Machinarium, we called it Pirate Amnesty because we need uh, press um, to notice our sale and inform people because it was sale on our own website not on steam and so we so we said that uh, we know about pirates and a lot of people pirated our game so we gave them chance to redeem them themselves just for the quarter of the price and call it pirate amnesty and and created this nice picture and the article was in every important uh, server and game media. It worked so well, and we sold more than 20,000 copies in a week or so. Um, also, channels, we don't have time for this, but uh, you should definitely focus on PC, I believe, not only on mobile, for example. It's, it's very, very difficult to start with only mobile games if you are a newcomer because uh, you uh, very probably will get mm, lost in a sheer amount of games on App Store or Google Play. So PC is very good for building community and for supporting your mobile release. 
console uh, is also good, but only if you have a good, uh, already successful game, because it's very difficult to get there. Um, discoverability problem, um, it's, of course, bigger and bigger problem. And you don't need only the great game, but also the support of community and word of mouth, and so on. And after lunch, when you can uh, what you can make are, of course, updates. You have to care about your game. You have to improve it constantly, and um, you should uh, pay attention to customer support. Uh, merchandising is a good idea if you have successful title, like we created uh, Plush Robot Josef. And just last week, <laughs> we started to sell also his girlfriend, Berta. And that's it. Uh, so let's talk about upcoming projects. Uh, at the moment, we are working on three projects. Um, one of them is still secret. Uh, it's made by our completely new team of young people. It's uh, being made in Unity. 2D, not 3D, uh, because we are exploring this new technology which might be good for us in the future. Otherwise, we still work in Flash, uh, which is great, great animation tool and great tool altogether, but I'm a bit afraid about its future. So I want to explore other, other possibilities. Uh, Jara Plachy, uh, the author of Botanicula, is working on his uh, new game, again, alone with his programmer and with musicians and sound makers, uh, the band Dva. It will be another funny, minimalistic thing. Um, and we are, the, the, the core team is working on Summer 3. Uh, we are working on this game for two and a half years already, and we expect to release it in 2015, so you see it takes a lot of time, and we are working really hard every day. Uh, and still it's like four years project, because it's extremely deta detailed and um, quite big in scope. It will take place on this uh, planet, which we know from uh, former uh, installments, but also on uh, four other planets and on three moons. So we'll be traveling across the space. And here I have some rough sketches and designs. This is the first time I show something from the game like this. This is one of the planets, we call it the yellow planet. Um, and here are designs from other parts. I can't reveal much about this game, but uh, we want to release it for PC, Mac, uh, mobile platforms, and if it will be possible also on some consoles, but it's not sure. And we work in full HD graphics. And uh, I guess you'll learn more about this game uh, later, <laughs> maybe next year. And that's it, and we have a little time, so I can... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to show you the the how we how we make uh, some sounds for <laughs> the new game. It's a lot of fun to just create sounds and music. So that's it, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.
Окей. Okay. Uh, пожалуйста, если у вас есть вопрос, поднимаем руку и не говорим до того, как у вас uh, есть микрофон. Uh, есть первый вопрос. Попытаемся сейчас включить микрофон. Uh, Hello. Uh, so the question is, when you start working on a game, how much time uh, does it take normally from the scratch till the final version? Um, it depends, of course, on uh, the game. But for Summer 3, for example, it looks like that it will take us four years. As I told you, Machinarium to took us three years with uh, half a year of pause. Um, and it's always uh, very difficult to start because we need to design the, not only the, the game design and the, the story, but the art style and everything. And uh, it takes us several months just to settle down on the style and approach to every new game. Um, So we start producing the game, really producing it uh, after half a year of preparations. Uh, so, thanks. And the team is of seven people, correct? Uh, yes, currently we are seven people working on Summer Three or six with uh, one external sound designer. I have a question right there. It's another one. First of all, I want to say thank you for such great games. Uh, and I have a technical question. Uh, why you selected Flash Platform for such a big project? Is it a good decision for now? How do you think? <laughs> It's a, it was a very difficult decision, to be honest, because Flash has a lot of drawbacks. But our games are uh, very dependent on animation. There's a huge amount of quite complicated animations. And Flash is a really good tool for anima animation. And uh, our animators know it. Uh, so we decided to make it in Flash even this time, even though it's much more complicated this time than before. Um, we use stage 3D and stuff. Uh, but I'm not technical technician, so I don't understand details very much. But we were considering Unity and decided for Flash. In the end. Uh, hi. Uh, what can you say about using drugs or any other chemicals <laughs> to free up your creativity and make your games better? <laughs> Tell us about your time in Amsterdam. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I, I don't think it will really... If If you are not talented, uh, it will stay like that, even if you eat whatever <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so otherwise, I'm not against it. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions? We have time. Uh, right, right here, first row. Hello. Uh, a simple question. Uh, what is uh, motivate power to do this hard work day by day? What is uh, what things inspired you? I think it's we really want to create something nice, beautiful, what we like to play and what we are proud of, and that's the main motivation. We really love our work, and we don't work for money. Of course, it's good to be sustainable and to be free. Uh, but we really love, love our work, work and, uh, and the final mm, products as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Is there some background info about the world of Botanical, like it was in the Machinarium, uh, ro robot planet, for forgotten planet, too, with trash and junk, and people do all this stuff? Is there some information about the world of Botanical? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Uh. <laughs> uh, in general, uh, 
машинариуме очень мир был описан, что там эта планета заброшена людьми, из мусора роботы самообразовались. Вот есть что-то подобное про Ботаникулус? So the question is about the background of Botanicalus world. So in Machinarium you had a lot of uh, mythology built around the world about yeah, yeah. where everyone came from. Do you have something like that in Botaniculus? Yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's work of my colleague Yara Plachy, but um, he also created uh, his own world in his head. It's, it's always good to, have, uh, to, to know more about the world and about the story than it's actually in the game. Uh, because it makes it easier for you to design each character. You really uh, need to live in that world, yeah. at least in your mind, for a while. Uh, so you can imagine whatever you want. Uh, and then it's very easy to, to design a character or some side story. So I believe uh, Yara no knew much more about the botanical background, but I don't know it because <laughs> it's his, his game. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, good day. Uh, the logic is uh, in your games is a bit twisted, uh, a bit strange. Uh, for example, the fuel, the fuel for the spaceship in Samaros 2. Uh, but it is some kind of intuitive, understandable. Was it clear goal, or was it just created while it develops? Yeah. You are, you are right. It's a bit cultic, especially in Summers 1 and 2. And it, it wasn't goal. It, it, um, at the time when I was designing these games, uh, I wasn't thinking ab about real game design. I was, I was designing the game very intuitively. So the, the final game is like that, sometimes uh, very strange and illogical. Uh, it changed in Machinarium, where I started to think about game design a bit different way. And in Summer of Threes, again, uh, evolved so to something else. Um, at, at places, it, uh, it follows the Summer of games with uh, intuitive approach, but it's, this time it's much more logical and there's more interactive toys uh, I was talking about and there's more playfulness in general. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap up with a final question. So, Jakub, we have an audience here of uh, a lot of independent developers, and as a successful independent developer yourself, what would be your biggest advice? How, uh, to, how to make a machinarium, basically? <laughs> how to motivate? What, what I think you, you, you really need to love your work and your, mo your, your main motivation shouldn't be a business because if you are going to make your first game, uh, there's a huge probability that it won't succeed uh, financially. But you can still make, can make a really nice uh, thing you could be proud, proud about. And just don't expect uh, you make money. <laughs> And that, that's not the motivation. You really want to make something artistic or nice and just enjoy the work. That's my only oh, And advice. we have one more question. We still have time. This will be the final question, then we're wrapping up. OK, thank you. Hello. Uh, now that Machinarium is done, uh, if you had a, uh, another chance, what do you would have done differently this time? And uh, are there any puzzles in Machinarium that couldn't get into the game for some reason? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think there are a couple of things we would change. Uh, we had a chance, mm. but mostly I think the, the worst mistakes we made after the release uh, with some publishers, uh, we decided wrongly and uh, I don't know, <laughs> it's difficult to summarize, it's, it's quite a few years back. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things we would make uh, differently, but all in all, we are quite proud of the game like it is, and we don't want to change it anymore. It's, uh, it somehow works. <laughs> and 
your other question was uh, about the puzzles. Uh, I, I think many, many puzzles uh, which we designed uh, are not in the game, but uh, we decided to not to put it there just because we didn't like them as much, so it was easy. Okay, uh, Jakub Dvorsky, everybody. Thank you.